Mm. Maybe we all need them and turn it into bedlam. Well, we are broadcasting now. Hello, everyone. Ooh, and we have people coming in. Uh, welcome to another Zoom webinar. We are going to start in about 10 minutes. But as you come in, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're from. It's really cool to see people coming through and uh, saying hi on the chat. Yeah. Thanks, uh, by the way, Stella, for posting that on the, uh, the forum that you posted on the invitation. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to have as many people as possible. Oh, I yeah. think it's, I, uh, it's yeah. good to have people coming in and joining the party. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> Hello, Dave. What? Both two Daves. Hello, Estonia. Estonia. Nebraska. Wow. Hi, Jason. That's a cool part. We see where people are from. Yeah, Cape Town. Cool. Hello, Cape, Cape Town. Town. Hey, Percy. Gotcha. I wasn't Percy. Uh, no. ha hello, UK. This is a good time to have this. I think it works as you no doubt thought it through for just about everywhere. Um, you know, considering the time zones are around the clock. Yeah. It, it, it inconveniences some individuals, especially those who are in, uh, in New Zealand and uh, um, some parts of Asia. Uh, but it's, it's really wonderful to see people coming. Uh, what, hello, India. What time is it there? It must be like almost midnight. Yeah, um, it's the middle of the night. Yeah. Luckily, our audience is astronomers. I don't know, but we, we get uh, some statistics when people register. So we're going to give you the data on that. Hi, Stephen from the UK. Arizona is here. Turkey is here. Oh, wonderful. There's, a, there's an astronomer uh, who uh, has done a lot of outreach with the Star Analyzer who got stuck in New Zealand several months ago with the shutdown. He's from Australia. Mm. And, uh, Mike, Mike Thompson. He may join us. Wonderful. We've got Salem, Oregon. Yeah, hi, Stephanie. Oh, another London, Kathy. Great. Gary Walker, Cape Cod. Germany, uh, Baby Star Man. Abbas and Jose from Spain. <clears throat> Whitby Island, Gray, you're just up the street. I'm down in Seattle. There's our South American first joiner, Rodolfo. Welcome. We're at 120 attendees right now, participants. Yeah. Oh. We have people coming. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm a Bella> Vista. <laughs> hey, it must be a good view there. <laughs> Ella Vista, home of uh, uh, Walmart. I've been there. Hey, yeah. <laughs> John, who's from Cape Town? Funny. Yeah. There was somebody else from Cape Town, too, Percy. Dave oh, is it another one? It's Dave, another line. A second Dave, good evening. <laughs> Dave, Dave Lane, my... Another Indian? Australia. Oh, Rummy Roger. There's somebody from Australia, Richard Southcock. Southcock. Robin, I'm sorry you can't get your, your uh, video working. Hi, Greg. Yeah, this is going to be recorded, and uh, Stella will post the link to the, her YouTube channel on the... Uh, webinar site on the AVSO webinar site. You can also contact me if you have trouble finding that link. Uh, Paul's on Paul Gernickson as well. The, the, hey, the last Paul. Paul. Paul, good evening. Hello, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I was your first one, Paul. Percy from South Africa. I built the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I built I built two. <laughs> ah, come on, I built the first one. <laughs> Rudy Cash from Mumbai. Wonderful. Thank you. 
This is going to be wonderful. Yes, we're going to be recording this. Um, <laughs> another Saturday for Midnight Coffee. This is uh, wonderful. Egypt. Thank you for joining oh, us. Man. We have Belgium, Alabama. Hello, Alabama. Uh, Egypt. Let's see, let's see. Uh, New Mexico, Ohio, Atlanta, Missouri. Uh, the UK, of course, is here. Australia, India, Peru. Hola, Thank Peru. You, <laughs> also, Frederick and uh, George, Hi, uh, Luxembourg and Greece. They uh, they posted in the Q and A section. Yeah. I do. I see the first fellow Houstonian. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> do you know Christian? I do not. I should. That sounds like it. We should have a party in Houston at some point, like an astro party, Lauren. Well, yeah. <laughs> Just saying. I predict we'd, armor we'd call. Having... Would we manage to get out of our little caves and travel again? Yeah. I'm guessing Bloomington, Illinois isn't going to be high on your priority list there, Stella. <laughs> that? Which one? Bloomington, Illinois. <laughs> Bloomington, Illinois. Well, I graduated from Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, so yeah. I know of oh, Bloomington, in Illinois. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't people, mind. A lot of people go to the wrong Bloomington because they don't know about Bloomington, Illinois. So here's an anecdote for you. The first time that I was going to visit Bloomington, Indiana, I almost ended up in Illinois. So that's why uh, I know about it. Exactly. I know of it. Because yeah. people were talking about uh, a train that gets there and the uh, admin assistant, the astronomy department was actually telling me that we don't have a train here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> well, I'm... Yes, I, I presented to your meeting not long ago. And John Pye from Hawaii, you're retired, man. I looked at your page, there's pictures of you on a sailboat and things. Oh, you're right. Aloha, welcome. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yes. Uh, oh, we have Canada. Of course, we have Canada. Uh, Milwaukee's there. Oh. Ireland, hi, Tony. So we have five more minutes and we'll get started. Oh, Barbados. Next yeah. webinar, we should have it in Barbados. We're, going, we're coming, Barbados. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Brazil. Oh, wow. Hey, Bert's on. It's so wonderful to see, see, virtually see so many known names and, new, and make new friends, even. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People from Pakistan, Tucson. Is there Pakistan here? Um, there are some individuals who are posting the Q&A window instead. Oh. Okay. Hello, Jordan. Welcome. See, spectroscopy France. knows no borders. Astronomy knows no borders. That's right. And there's Pascal Ooh. from Paris, France. Hi, Pascal. Good to see you. Excuse me. <laughs> and Steve Tonkin, you made it. You ditched your family event for us. <laughs> it will be forgiven. <laughs> wow. Quincy, Massachusetts. Hi, Quincy. Maybe you can see me waving from my window. Stella, do you have a, do you have, on your screen, on your side, do you have a, a, a total number of attendees that's shown anywhere? Uh, uh, opportunities for... Attendees. 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 Yeah. Uh, I do have the attendees on my screen. So right no, now... Only the ones that are actually logging in, do you have the number? Yes. Right now we are at 800 and, uh, 280. Wow. Percy, it's on the little, the little toolbar at the bottom of the screen where you share your... Where the number of participants, you should be able to see it. Oh, uh, there, uh, there, 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 there's the total. Thank you. I saw that. Yeah, there it is. Yes, that's quite, quite a number. Maurice, so. uh, we've got cameras disabled for the webinar, so your camera won't come on. Oh, okay. 
Hi, Pablo. Good to see you again. Philippines. Hey, there's there's Norma Illinois. Hey, Tom. I see ya. <laughs> I saw Bill from Houston. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Christian. New Zealand, John Drummond made it in. Ooh, hi, John. Wonderful. He was at Swinbourne hmm? for some time. Yeah. Hi, Arto. Franz, US. Let's give it a couple of minutes until people settle a little bit. So is this a record for the AVSO attendee numbers? I think we're reaching a record, yeah. A record here. Yeah. Just, just to tell everyone else, well, guys, we have 303 people on, online at the moment, which is quite substantial. I've never yeah. seen such a number before no. on a telco. It's certainly yeah, Nick from France and I've ever, I've ever addressed concurrently. <laughs> yeah, Christophe. <laughs> uh, Willie, you're right. It's well-used bookshelf. Best time. Lima, Peru. Hey. May from Iraq. Welcome. Mays. Thank you for coming. Hey, Enrique. I, I think after this, uh, after this webinar, you're going to run right out and buy that RSpec. <laughs> Mohit, another Indian. Fan fantastic. All right. So I think that it is time for us to get started slowly. Um, I have some introductory remarks, but first, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for another webinar. Um, I am here with a stellar group of individuals. I'm sharing my screen here. Share. Here we are. Uh, and we have a wonderful lineup of presenters giving you a glimpse to the wonderful world of small telescope spectroscopy, which hopefully will both tempt and inspire you uh, to try your hand in spectra. I would like to start by acknowledging the support of the Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation that provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, like the Journal of the AVSO. They have been a close partner and ally to the AVSO and supporter for years, and they are supporting this webinar. And also, Attic Camera, which manufacture a diverse range of quality astrophotography cameras and accessories, along with a range of free software to help you maximize the output of your equipment. For more information, please go to their webpage and they, they are supporting this webinar as well. Uh, let's start with um, a couple of housekeeping items. At the very bottom of your screen, there are two buttons that should be of interest and relevance to you. One for the Zoom chat and uh, hello to everyone who's introducing themselves right now there. And the second one for Q&A. This is for questions that you might have during the presentations. Please feel free to use this window, the Q&A window to ask any questions you want answered from uh, by our speakers. We will address all questions after the presentations. Feel free to ask at any time though. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, please feel free to go to the observing section uh, forum and ask your questions there and someone's gonna come back to you. Another uh, item that is of interest to you on your left hand side down here, you can see a little icon that looks like a microphone. This leads to a drop-down menu that provides a selection which control your audio settings. If you have any issues with your audio, please look at the relevant settings. I cannot help you or we cannot help you from here to fix them, but this is a way to actually fix them. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and invite Tom Peel to get us started. Tom, take it from here. Thank you very much. Let me get my screen shared and get some things set up. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's very encouraging to see the interest here. Uh, you saw the schedule there. We have a lot of material to cover. Uh, I'm going to go pretty fast. It's, it may end up feeling like you're drinking from a fire hose, but uh, there'll be a video republished of this uh, on the AAVSO site. will be a link to their YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing your questions at the end of this presentation. <clears throat> 
So before I dive in, I, I've been thinking about the, what I wanted to communicate to the group. And I've given these talks a fair amount, so I've got some, some ideas about it. You might want to get into capturing Star Spectre if you remember that thrill of the first image, <clears throat> excuse me, you took of the moon. For me, it was blurry, it was, it was overexposed, but it was gorgeous, right? You, you, like me, were probably showing it to your friends and coworkers. Well, that thrill, of course, fades over time. And I found by getting into a new field like this, I recaptured that thrill. Maybe you want to do some science. You've come to the right place with the AAVSO. Maybe you want to recreate some science. Maybe you want to contribute to Pro-Am projects. We're going to talk about both of those as we go on through the various presentations today. Maybe you don't like spending a lot of money to get started in a new activity. And I think you'll see tonight that there's a, a lot of different ways you can get started without spending a lot of money. This may be the most important one for me. And that is when you own the data, you learn more from it. You're interested. You do a little digging and a little research and you actually remember some of it. For with me, things go in one ear and out the other. So I found when I own the data, things stick a little better. Spectroscopy doesn't require the same kinds of dark, <clears throat> excuse me, dark sky sites that, uh, that visual imaging requires. So uh, you don't have to travel to a, a country location. And trust me, if a knuckle dragging programmer like me can understand this, so can you. You don't have to have a PhD in physics. This is the kind of thing you'd wanna do. You wanna learn a little bit more about what we're observing. You can go as deep as you wish or like me, not very deep. I'm broad, but really shallow. So also the other thing I wanted to mention is how easy this is to do. It doesn't require the hours of integration time or fancy equipment. I'm not a do-it-yourselfer. I break just about everything I touch. You know, in Windows, edit, undo, or control Z is my favorite command. You're going to see that this is not a do-it-yourself type of project, unless you want it to be. If you're doing public outreach, if you'd like to mentor students, I think you'll see some screens tonight that uh, really blow your socks off and have a huge impact. And finally, somewhat frivolously, you want to hang out with a cool crowd? That's not me. But that is about 10,000 amateurs around the world who are doing this today. So let's jump in. That'll be the most words you see on one screen, I promise. A little bit of science here just to get people to the same level. Of course, Newton discovered that you could split light into its component colors with a prism. You can also do that by reflecting the light off a finely lined surface or through a finely lined surface. Fraunhofer, about 200 years ago, is credited with inventing the first spectrometer and observing the spectra of stars. This is the kind of thing he saw, but not with this much detail back then. It's beautiful aesthetically even. And these lines are as if barcodes for stars. And they tell us a lot about stars. A majority of the astronomical research that gets done today uses spectroscopy. So even if it's not something you end up doing yourself by listening today, maybe even doing some of the home projects that I'll suggest later, you'll learn a lot and help in understanding what you're reading. But barcodes reveal a lot of the physical properties of stars. And we're going to look at examples of these as we go through. Now, Bunsen was uh, in around 1850, and he invented his Bunsen burner to burn samples, split the light in a prism, and look at the results. And he cataloged everything he burned, and that catalog served us going forward in the future decades and centuries to come. Kirchhoff, we're not going to spend a lot of time on. Uh, I'll mention just one thing that he had to say, and that is sometimes you have a spectrum that has a rainbow background, that Roy G. Biv red through blue background with gaps, and sometimes you have an emission spectrum that's more or less dark with lines. The interesting thing about it is those lines are in the same place regardless of which one you get, and which one you get is beyond the scope of our discussion today, but it's interesting science. These lines are like fingerprints, and the hydrogen lines are so often used that we've given them a name, the hydrogen bomber lines, and each line has been given a Greek letter like we give to the stars in the constellations. You can see that each element has a unique, unique spectrum. We don't have to burn things these days. We use gas tubes. I've got one here, for example. This is a helium gas tube. If I don't break it there, bang it into a light, uh, and you can see it just, uh, it prevents us from burning, burning down the house. So uh, we, there are also ways to do spectrum with a little desktop spectrometer that, uh, that we created for teachers in front of classrooms to make it easy to teach. This is pretty cool. This is the periodic table of spectrum. You're going to hear this uh, a couple times tonight. There's the hydrogen spectrum. Notice there are the hydrogen alpha, 
beta, and gamma lines, our friends that we'll be seeing throughout the evening. Up here in the right, you can see, for example, helium has a very different spectrum. How do we get these lines? Now, many of you know this. Stick with me. We're just about done the science uh, introduction. The Bohr model of the atom has electrons in orbits. And again, forgive me for the terminology, those of you who know more. Uh, and those electrons are jumping or they move between shells. And when they move down like that, they can emit light that we may be able to see. There is when it jumps, from example, from shell five to two, we get this hydrogen gamma line at that wavelength. So different jumps have different colors. Now, if we look at this hydrogen beta line here, if the electron is going up from shell two to three, then we get an absorption spectrum, which is that continuum of the rainbow with a gap in it. So we're going to see examples of both of those uh, as we move in. Here's a, an overly complicated uh, example of a spectroscopy setup. Uh, this is Dale Mace's. I, I wonder whether he regrets ever having given this to me to share. Uh, it's such a rat's nest, but uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful spectrum or wonderful piece of equipment, but more than we need. What I'm going to focus on tonight, primarily with some other examples, is a small little grating called a star analyzer mounted in an inch and a quarter uh, filter cell. They're only about $200, and you can just mount them most anywhere. So here's an example of one mounted on the nose of a DSLR, and down here is the spectrum hydrogen alpha, beta, and gamma of Vega. Now, notice this doesn't even have any tracking. So it's, this is, I show just to show you the simplicity of it. It's not particularly easy. It's small aperture. You've got to do a drift scan and get things set up right. But I, I wanted to point out how simple it is. There's no magic here. It's just a grading on a conventional camera. There's lots of ways to mount a grading like this. Uh, you can mount it on a DSLR. This is a thread adapter that adapts the lens cap threads uh, to uh, the inch and a quarter threads of the grading. And this way, the light goes through the grading first before it goes through the lens, so you can get a little higher resolution. But you can use a cool fit camera. You can use, you know, just a, like this ZWO video camera. Uh, down here, you can uh, mount the uh, grading in a, in, a filter, in a filter cell, in a, a filter wheel. So there's lots of ways to mount these things. Now, when you step up an order of magnitude and cost and usability or ease of use, you get into slit devices, and we'll look at examples tonight in my talk, uh, as well as the talks that are following me, where you can see the advantage of a slit. Now, the challenge is you're guiding on maybe a 20 micron slit. You have to acquire your target on that. Most people start out with a slitless grading like the one I just showed. There are also devices, and we'll hear some talks from, or uh, some description from Tim on this, uh, a do-it-yourself 3D printed spectrometer. Uh, and I think Percy's also gonna talk about this. You can mount a DSLR piggybacked on your telescope and do both at once, slit and non-slit. Okay, the history's behind us. Take a deep breath, both you and me, and let's dive in. What can we actually do? So you put a grating in the light path from a star through your telescope and you get a spectrum. Here's a cool example. This is done by Torsten Hansen. You can see his name down here in the corner. And he did this with just an eight inch Newtonian and a video camera. And this is separate spectra captured at different times in temperature order. So the hot stars, the B stars are up here, and it goes down through the A's and F's and K's and M's. Look at the differences just there in this qualitative view. I'll just point out two of the differences right here. Look at these wide bands down here on the cool M stars. That's because these stars are cool enough that the molecules that are in the outer layer don't get burned up. One other example I want to show you, because I just don't have time to go through all the exciting stuff on this. This feature right here is the hydrogen beta line. And it's right around 4,800. And notice how dark and wide it is there on the type A star. Now remember, these are being caused, this is the beta line, by that electron jumping between shell four and two. Now the hotter stars up here, these B stars, are, are so energetic in their heat that a lot of electrons go right past that level four. So we don't get that four to two transition. And the cooler stars down here, a lot of the electrons don't get pumped up to that level. So we don't get that transition. This is a gorgeous image. And it, it, there's a lot of astrophysics to be learned from this if you care to. Frankly, I, as I said, haven't gone that deep. We've got professionals like Stella and other very knowledgeable people, not only on the panel, but also as attendees. So if I was, 
you can see that crosshairs there to say to you, can you see it dims a little bit in the robin egg blue? Maybe you can see it. But you know, if I was going to publish a paper and say, well, we use the Hubble spectrograph, we saw a little dimming in the robin egg blue. Wouldn't get published, right? So we need to quantify it. And we do an intensity graph. This is pretty straightforward. And those of you who are already doing a lot of this, forgive me, we'll get on to other things in a moment. So the star is bright and narrow. So this intensity peak, that's the intensity axis there, is tall and narrow. This is dim, wider, 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 dim. So this is dim, uh, stronger, stronger, dim. The cool thing is with this intensity graph, we can see that dip. Now we're doing science. We can look at the width of that, the full width half maximum, where it's located, how it changes, how it compares to other stars. This is the science of it all. How do we get that graph? Well, my story is I got a grading about 11 years ago. I went out of my backyard, out that window here in Seattle, three miles from downtown, from the Pike Place Market, if you know what that is, here in the US. And I came in, it was August, I looked at Vega, I came in at midnight, grass stains on my knees, right? Because Vega's overhead. And uh, the next morning I tried to create a graph with the software that was out there and I couldn't, I gave up. I was so frustrated, I told my wife, this is supposed to be fun. This is a hobby, I'm not having fun. Well, I put it away, I gave up. But I really wanted to do this, excuse me one moment. So I really wanted to do this and so I ended up writing a piece of software to do it. I did that Saturday, Sunday, it was done. I got my graph and now 11 years old, later and uh, maybe 10 or 15,000 hours of programming later, it's almost done. My wife says, would you finish it so we can start having dinner at a decent time? And what I wanna do is I'm not gonna do a software demo. We don't have time for that. But one of the obstacles getting into a new field for me as well as many of us is I don't wanna learn another piece of software, right? So this is my software. This is the first image I captured. Uh, there's the star, there's the spectrum. Notice there's, there's some gaps there. And all we do is bracket in the region that we want to study and we're good to go. And when we do that, we get that intensity graph. Here that peak is the star and the spectrum here with that dip is this and there's the dip. So that's all well and good, but what are those dips? Remember I mentioned Bunsen cataloged everything. So the software has a catalog built into it and I can say, show me where those hydrogen bomber lines that we've seen would be if they're on this graph. And look, those reference lines go through our data. So here with a backyard telescope, a C8, uh, in Seattle, light polluted area with a video camera. This is actually a video. We can make it pretty with some eye candy and let's play the video for a second. You can see it jumping around because the seeing is changing, but basically this is a scientific spectrum that we can extract data from. I'm not gonna get into a lot more detail. Uh, the one thing I wanna show you uh, is I'd like you, if you would, just to keep this part of the image uh, in your mind's eye because I'm gonna show this a little further down the way as examples with these hydrogen lines that were used, not my software, but these lines were used in a significant discovery. So let me, uh, many significant discoveries. Let me come back to my PowerPoint show here and we will continue on. Here's an outdoor demonstration of gas tubes. This is in France. I think that's Olivier's head from Sheliac. Uh, if those of you who know him may recognize it. Uh, this is just gas tubes, but I think they went on and looked at star spectra. Here's a wide field star spectrum uh, image. There's a star, there's a spectrum with some emission lines. Okay, so when Janet Simpson sent me this, I have a confession to make to this group, and this is the biggest group I've ever confessed this to. I couldn't remember what a wolf A star was. I had read about them over the years, over the decades, but unless you're using the data, it doesn't, for me anyway, stick. Well, Wikipedia is your friend. wolf A stars are massive late stage stars. The outer layers have been dissipated and we're looking down towards the core and we're seeing carbon. Now remember, stars burned their way through the elements and this star, we're seeing carbon down in the core with a DSLR and a mechanical tracker and 30 seconds worth of exposure time. Okay, let's look at an extended object like M57, the ring nebula. That's what it's going to look like and we can see these are emission features, but most extended objects with a slitless grating are not interesting. In this case, because it's an emission object and some other things, you can actually see the object there, but most of the time extended objects don't look interesting. And that's when we step up 
to the slit spectrometers I was talking about. Here's the Orion Nebula. The same features are visible. This is clearly an extended object, but because we have a slit, we're just seeing those peaks so we can do science. That's the advantage of a slit device for doing higher resolution, interesting scientific spectra. So here's uh, Uranus and Neptune, also done by Torsten Hansen with a video camera. We can see up here, uh, if I can find my mouse, there it is. We can see here the spectrum with some gaps and those gaps show up here. And that's the methane on these planets on a backyard video uh, set up. So in 1881, Henry Draper captured the spectrum of a comet. Heck, if Hank can do it, so can we. Here's a spectrum by Vikrant Agni Hotri. Uh, you can see down here, uh, it's a beautiful little string of jewels. Here are the swan bands, and you can see he did this with just an 80 millimeter refractor. Um, this is a pretty cool spectrum, but let's get it. He's a, actually a nuclear power plant engineer in Northwest India. Uh, and it does some really neat work. Here, for example, is a more recent spectrum done with a star analyzer, and you can see uh, there's the sodium on NeoWise. I apologize that I can't spend more time on each of these talking about them. Anybody who uses a C-clamp on their telescope setup, that's my kind of person. And with me, the problem is I tighten that C-clamp so tight I'd buckle the housing and destroy the camera. Here is a star analyzer that Robin Leadbeater put on the camera, didn't destroy it like I would have, Here's a single frame, and in that frame, the meteor traveled that distance. Here's its spectrum with an outburst, a bolide right there. There's the spectrum he captured. This is a sort of an esoteric branch of spectroscopy, but it's one, if it floats your boat, why not? And, and a lot of people do do it. Um, again, I'm not gonna talk and explain Doppler shift to this group. We don't have time for that, but of course it's the pitch change or the wavelength change when things are moving. So if we were expecting to see lines, for example, right here, like that triplet, and instead we saw them here, we would know that we have some redshift and the object was moving away from us. On the other hand, if the features we were expecting here were over there, we'd have blue shift, so the object was coming towards us. Let's see how we can use that with a backyard setup. Let's look at a type 1a supernova. Again, I'm not gonna get into the details. It's two stars orbiting each other. Uh, eventually the uh, larger one has some of its gas uh, dumped onto the smaller one. And when you pour gas onto something hot, you get an explosion. So here's a uh, spectrum in M101. This is the supernova. There's an image of a different type 1a supernova from a different era, but notice the shell-like feature there. It's a, you can see that it's a sphere more or less. So, there's a spectrum captured by David Strange with a nine inch telescope in less than 15 minutes worth of integration time. There's the spectrum he captured and look at that deep dip. Now we all know we're standing on the shoulders of giants. The giants have figured out that different supernova types have different spectral fingerprints. So a core collapse supernova is different than these type 1a supernova with the two stars. Here's a beautiful chart that was developed Again, this isn't going to be on the quiz, don't worry. So on this type 1a supernova, you can see this deep silicon dip that doesn't exist on these core collapse supernovae. And that dip is down right around 6,000 angstroms. So what David Strange did was measure that that dip was at 6150. And look what he did, this is pretty cool. That identifies it more or less as a type 1 and supernova, type 1a. So, David took that measure and he compared it to what ionized silicon wavelength would be in the lab if Bunsen had burnt beet sand, for example. Those two numbers are different, right? So Wikipedia is your friend. I couldn't remember the Doppler shift formula. There it is. You plug the numbers in. There's the shell. There's the blue shift of that shell expanding towards us. Wow. On a backyard telescope. Now, some of you may recall this guy's name, Adam Reese. He and his team just before the turn of the century uh, did work that earned the super or the supernova. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good or bad thing to earn. So um, he uh, earned the Nobel Prize in 2011 for the cosmological expansion studies he did, and he used Type 1a supernovae as standard candles. Somehow, I think the equipment he used was probably a little more than this. But I'll tell you, bang for your buck for for 200 bucks, you get a lot more than the million dollar telescopes he was using. What about the spectrum of a black hole? Now, of course, the black hole doesn't emit any light, but what about the matter that's in the accretion disk? So David Hayworth with, an, uh, I think this is a modified security camera, 
captured 3C273. There it is. There's the spectrum with two dots. There's the spectrum. There's the two dots, the emission lines. There's the plot. So in the mid-1960s, Martin Schmidt was in his mid-20s. He looked at this, and there's a great transcript of an interview with him that describes his experience. Uh, it's linked on our site. Ask me for it if you want it. It's a fascinating read. He was really frustrated. He could not figure out what these emission lines, these peaks were. So he decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back to basics. I'm going to at least eliminate them being the hydrogen bomber lines. He pulled up a hydrogen bomber reference, that, like the one in my software I asked you to keep in your mind's eye. Do you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose yet? <laughs> so, and when, oh, by the way, um, my wife always says I should dress for success. I forgot to put this on. You know, it's a little messy right now because, you know, the thing is, I keep calling my salon and they're not picking up. I, I don't know what's happened. And the, I mean, that's, for example, that's the hydrogen alpha line right there, if you look down deep enough. But if you look deeper, the problem is that there's a lot of gray down in there. Now, I know a lot of you at home know what I'm talking about with those gray roots there. It's a problem, right? But anyway, so Martin Schmidt was able to first look at these lines and say, well, they're not hydrogen, right? This, this bright hydrogen alpha line doesn't correspond to any of the bright peaks here, except then he figured out that they did, but they were massively shifted to the red. So the discovery here was that this object was so far away, two billion light years away to cause that shift using the Hubble constant to calculate. That meant it was enormously bright if we could see it at that distance and we could calculate the velocity of it uh, with a backyard telescope. What amazes me is this ancient light, having traveled so far, still had information in it that we could extract. It's amazing, really amazing. Nothing ages as well as light, I'm convinced. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. Now, I know I'm throwing stones in a glass house. He's got a full head of hair, I'm envious. Okay, so far, every astronomer I've mentioned has been an old white man. Let's look at some of the women and others in astronomy who haven't gotten the PR and the recognition. Of course, Annie Jump Cannon and her computers were prohibited from accessing telescopes because of their gender. So they analyzed the, the plates that contain the specter that came in off the telescopes operated by men. And they did a fantastic job. Uh, they looked at tens of thousands of spectra and with that massive data and their ingenuity and insight, they came up with a classification scheme uh, that has helped us understand the stars. Priyamvada Nataraja uh, is at uh, Yale, and she studies uh, massive black holes and gravitational lensing. Nancy Grace Roman was the first astronomer at NASA. She got her PhD in the late 40s. And uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was her vision, and she drove it to make it happen. Elisa Quintana studies exoplanets and discovered one around, a, a, I believe it's a red giant, in the Goldilocks zone where there might be liquid water and thus perhaps life. And finally, Jedediah Eisler is at Dartmouth, and uh, she studies uh, hyperactive black holes. Uh, opportunities are increasing. We have people like Stella as professionals, as well as many others in the field. This is a new slide to me, and when I researched this slide, it was like running down a, falling down a rabbit hole. There were so many fascinating women in the field who haven't gotten recognition. Fortunately, that's changing. We have a long way to go. Two more examples, and I'm done. So, um, so I can take a breath here. So, so far, we've been looking at the spectra of things like features like these, very broad hydrogen features. We saw some carbon. We saw some other ionized oxygen. But what if we want to go deeper? I think probably almost everybody, with maybe one in 200, starts with a slit spectrometer. Most people start because there's plenty of learning to be done just with a grading. So when, uh, when people uh, get to the point where they want to dig a little deeper, then they, they, for example, let's look at how deep or how wide, excuse me, this feature is, this hydrogen uh, line. You know, it's 20, 30, 40 or so, you know, angstroms wide. If we want to drill down and zoom in on a feature with more resolution, that's when we need a slit spectrometer and the additional expense and difficulty, but you get higher resolution. And so often what we do is we compare two objects and see what the differences are. So let's see on a slit spectrometer what the moon and Vega show up as for hydrogen alpha. So the red is moon, 
And the fuchsia, that's the technical name for the color, the fuchsia is vega. Notice that they're in different positions because of Doppler shift. We're now measuring the radial velocity of vega. The moon isn't really appreciably coming towards or away from us, so we use that as our, our zero. So, but notice also this takes higher resolution, you know, 0.67 angstroms. We couldn't possibly measure something that narrow on a scale like that. Final example of the day, uh, I've got a visual aid here. This is a star. It's rotating very quickly. This edge is coming towards you as, and the light that comes off this edge, that edge is receding from you. So this coming towards you, that light is blue shifted. And this light going away from you is red shifted. So what we would normally have on a star for hydrogen alpha is a sharp peak. But now what's happened is some of that light that would normally be here is shifted over here into the wing on the blue shift. And some of that light is shifted over here onto the red shift. Let's look at what that would look like. Here we can see on Altair in blue, the results of that broadening because of the Doppler shift because of that high speed of rotation. This also on a slit spectrometer. So those are the examples I wanted to show you tonight. Just quickly uh, to get started, you need a grading of some sort. You need any type of camera. It can be a DSLR, it can be a Fitz camera, color monitor, video. You may need some sort of adapter in mounting your grading. Very often, you can just screw the grating right onto the nose piece of a camera like this camera here. But it depends on your camera pixel size and the, the uh, other factors in your, in your light train, like uh, the focal length of your telescope. So this doesn't have to be an exact distance. It's not like focusing, but it, you don't want it too close or too far away. There's a calculator on my site that, that walks you through that, and I'm always happy to answer questions and frequently do because this is a little bit of a speed bump which I'm told in uh, some places is called a, a sleeping policeman. It's a little bit of an obstacle to getting started, and uh, uh, I, I can ease you over that. You also need software. My software that I showed you for a moment is RSpec. There's other freeware out there that does a good job, too. Um, again, I, I ended up writing my own. So, a couple things. Even with that reference in my software, still the question comes, because I'm not the Doug Welshes or the Stella Kafkas, right? I, I don't know exactly what is what. I'm not an astrophysicist. So these are the kinds of books that really are helpful. And I just want to show you two pages in this book. It's got sample spectra that are all called out, which isn't good enough for, for me because I go, well, so what? There's oxygen. So what? There's helium. I don't know what that means. But the cool thing about this book is he has a lot of text that explains it. So whether you're going to do spectroscopy or whether you're just going to read about it, this is a great source book for learning. Um, my software is downloadable for free for 30 days. And the reason I mention that is the AVSO attended a workshop that I did a few years ago, about 100 people on, on getting started with the software. And a link to that YouTube video is also here, as well as the sample data. So even if you don't plan to ever do any spectroscopy, don't even own a telescope, you know, live in a cave and never get out, so it's always dark where you live, but there's no sky visible, you could tonight or tomorrow download the software, sample data, watch that YouTube video, and after that hour workshop, you would really have it in your bones as to what spectroscopy is all about. It's a fun project. Stella's gonna talk more about how the AAVSO is moving into spectroscopy and the great work that they've done. There are opportunities for pro-am collaboration. There are more and more coming as more of us get involved. Uh, and that's all I, all I have time to say tonight. I also give this talk in a more leisurely manner uh, to clubs. If you're interested, you can just contact me on my site. I'd like to thank you all for your time, for smiling at some of my jokes, I hope. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk this evening. Thanks again. Um, thank you very much. This was awesome. All right, so let me continue. Uh, I need to share my screen. Uh, so now we talked about spectra and their properties. We can look into what properties we measure from those spectra and what data tells us about variable, various types of variable stars. There's something for everyone. So depending on your spectrograph resolution, your time, your interest, you can find appropriate stats to study. So I'm going to give you a, a small tour of what kind of information we're getting from spectra. Uh, and uh, from there on, the sky is not your limit. So let me start with a reminder. From our spectra, we measure three main quantities. 
first, uh, the, what we call radial velocity, which is a deviation of your spectral line of a, the spectral line of our interest from its rest wavelength. This indicates more or less a, um, an in, a deviation that translates to velocity. If the rest wavelength of a line is characterized by this quantity lambda here, and this deviation is delta lambda, then the velocity is being given by this uh, easy equation. C is the speed of light. So uh, this is telling you how fast something moves with respect to your rest wavelength. The second quantity is what we call a line equivalent width, or W. This is a measure of the area of the line on the plot of intensity versus wavelength. In principle, how much stuff, how much flux is in the line, how strong the line is. And the third is what we call full width half max. It's exactly what the name actually says. You take a line, you find the maximum intensity, you go at the, at the half width, and you measure the, um, the width of the line profile. This is a common description of the line itself and describes mostly line broadening. So with that, what type of information are we getting from spectra? The first thing is what Tom mentioned as well. We get information what type of chemical elements exist in the object of our interest. Imagine that those elements are represented by barcodes, similar to unique bar barcodes repre that represent common products in the supermarket. And I'm using here as an example, the barcode of a bottle of water. Um, when we go to the cashier to pay for this water bottle, the cashier scans the barcode and the computer identifies that this is a bottle of water. So what the computer does is that uh, it looks at the barcode and it looks at three main characteristics. The thickness of the lines here, the spacing between the lines and the fact that all the lines are present to actually identify this unique barcode with this unique product. It's a similar thing with cellar spectra. Each chemical element is being characterized by a set of lines or colors, which is the unique barcode of that particular element. So each element has its own characteristic group of colors or wavelengths that represent their atomic structure and are a telltale of its presence in the stellar atmosphere. So when we're looking at spectra and try to identify elements in the stellar atmosphere, we look at the strength of the spectral lines, the spacing between them, and the fact that they all need to be there to identify a specific element. This is an example of four different elements, hydrogen, helium, mercury, and uranium, with their characteristic barcodes. They're all different, they're very unique. And as Tom mentioned, this is one of my favorite periodic tables of elements. This is a spectroscopist's periodic table of elements, showcase the special barcodes for all chemical elements. Now, the second thing that we measure is outflows, winds. These are results of uh, stars expelling some of their outer layers for whatever reason and surrounding themselves with a shell of gaseous nebula, gaseous material. To diagnose uh, or assess a wind, we're looking at the shape of specific line profiles. Um, and the reason be behind this is uh, based on the principles of Kirchhoff's laws that Tom mentioned a little bit, but we're not getting um, into details. But in principle, this is what's happening. Say that we have a star here embedded in a nebula, and here's your observer. What your observer will observe is se several superimposed phenomena. She will see absorption from the gas in front of the star, this is A, components A, and then she will see emission from the gas components B and C that uh, look like that. So if you put all of them together, what she will see is a line profile that looks like this, which is called a p signy line profile, and it's a very characteristic telltale of winds or outflows from stars. Another thing that we measure is rotational velocity, how fast something spins or uh, how fast something moves. And this is based, uh, it's a principle that is based on, uh, on the Doppler effect. And pretty much it tells us more or less how fast uh, something, either an atmospheric layer moves or a star rotates or actually one object moves with respect to another. So again, if your observer is here, what she will see from an object that is not rotating is a narrow line profile. And that line profile is gonna be stretched and become much more wide when the star is rotating. The faster the object rotates, the wider the line profile will be. So, okay, fine. So we, we know the principles. 
what kind of things are, can we study with this particular information. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about different types of objects, different types of variable stars that you, study, that you can study. And I'm gonna start with chromospherically active stars. These are stars which have, which have very active chromospheres like our sun. They have large spotted regions, they have flares, coronal mass ejections. We see a variation of the strength and shape of spectral lines due to these cold spots on the stellar surface and chromospheric emission. And actually, if you're lucky to detect a flare, then you also see a huge increase in the continuum of the spectra. The lines of interest in this case are Balmer hydrogen lines in emission and usually calcium H and K um, in absorption and in emission. And here's an example. On the left hand side, uh, you can see this is actually the example of uh, HR 1099, it's a, an Conven type star. And this particular plot on the uh, left hand side is pretty much a time tag spectral sequence that shows changes in the H alpha line profile as the star rotates. Distortion of the spectral line profiles in this case, the shape of the spectral lines are due to cool spots on the stellar atmosphere. This bottom plot showcases changes in the calcium H and K line. You see emission, superimposing absorption, and you will also detect changes in the strength or equivalent widths of the lines. Another thing that you can do is study pulsating stars. Pulsating variables are intrinsic variables. The variation in brightness is due to a physical change of the size of the star. So pretty much they look like bouncing balls. This is a sketch of a, a light curve of uh, one of those stars. And you can actually follow with spectra the pulsation cycle. Spectral uh, changes due to this periodic expansion and contraction of various atmospheric layers. And this is an example of the hydrogen line at different phases of RLIRA itself. You know, I really like this type of stars because you can follow a full cycle, a full kind of increase and decrease of the brightness of the star during a night if you're interested in just taking time results spectra. The third case has to do with radio velocity of binaries. Now, binary star systems are objects that are moving around the common center of mass. So when the inclination of the binary is just right, that the, uh, you can actually see, uh, uh, see spectral lines moving in the wavelength. So here's your observer again. She sees a shift of the lines in the wavelength scale with respect to the rest wavelength, which translates to changes in radio velocity. So those shifts are due to the two stars moving around the common center of mass, some away from us and some towards us at any time. Now, in this particular case, once we disentangle the spectral line that comes from each of the stellar components, your observer can calculate the radio velocity of each star, and she can plot it in a radio velocity um, versus time graph. So for each of the two stars, you can see this kind of wobbly line that is giving you information on the relative motion of the stellar components of the binary. You know, one of my very favorite objects are cataclysmic variables. So I cannot have a presentation without showing them. This is uh, a very interesting case of binary star systems uh, in which the stellar components are very close to each other. We're talking about cataclysmic variables, symbiotic stars, novae, and they're some of the most complicated and, and most rewarding objects to study, both in light curves and spectra. Those binaries consist of a white dwarf, which is this little thingy here, that is cannibalizing its companion, which is usually a low mass sequence star, low mass star, through an accretion disk. So what we see in the spectral lines is really complicated. It depends on the accretion rate of the system and the inclination of the binary. So the binary is still and it's moving around the common center of mass. So some of the phenomena we study are related to accretion physics, the accretion disk, the accretion stream, the stellar components, which is the white dwarf and the donor star, et cetera, et cetera. These are also sites of nova eruption, when the white dwarf collects a lot of material on its outer atmosphere and ejects part of its atmosphere in the ISN. And this is where things become complicated and very, very interesting. This is an AVSO light curve of uh, V1369 Sen, a, a nova that reached third magnitude, really, really very bright. And this is a zoom in at the, at the first two months of the nova. Uh, so you can see dramatic changes in the light curve of the star, which are actually all real, and they have to do with the physics uh, of the, the ejected material, the two stars as being heated, etc. And this is a time series of uh, uh, spectra around the H alpha line from different parts of the light curve. Um, so 
as materials e ejected and they're shocking, they, they're colliding with each other. Uh, you see these kind of bumps in the light curve. Uh, so, and, and you see p signal profiles, varying line profiles, radio velocity changes, all kinds of line components that come from all parts of, the, of those systems. These are really cool to, to study um, continuously. I mean, just take time to spectra, uh, the one after the other after the other, you can see line profiles changing. And actually for the observers in our audience, right now we have five different novae uh, in our alert page that would definitely, definitely benefit from spectra. So please look at our alerts page for more information and targets. And the last uh, object that would, I would like to, to talk about is supernovae. Um, Tom talked a little bit about supernova type 1As uh, that are really very important for cosmology, but the bottom line is when you see a supernova eruption erupting, how do you know what kind of supernova they are, what type of supernova they are? And what you really need to do about supernova type 1A is just take a, a low resolution spectra with a star analyzer and uh, look for two different features. The lack of detection of hydrogen and the presence of silicon in the spectra. That's all you need to know. And then you know that you have one of the interesting for cosmology um, targets. You know, all this information and even more uh, could be found on our webpage. I just gave you a, a glimpse of the possible science that we can do. And actually on the observing section page, you can find specific observing targets per science cage that are that can be appropriate for all resolutions and all types of, of uh, uh, telescopes. And actually in this webpage, you can reach the ADSO spectroscopy database, AVSpec. Now this database is an open access repository of variable star spectra that come from our observers, which complement light curves from our photometry database in order to provide a comprehensive picture of various phenomena of interest to the AVSO community. Just imagine light curves and spectra together. We can really probe the interior of stars. We can really do science. We can figure out what's going on in there. The main idea also is to build a long-term database of stellar spectra alongside long-term light curves. So if you have 100 years of photometry and you have 100 years of spectra, that can tell a really very interesting story of some of our favorite dynamic phenomena in the universe. Now, all the spectra that are being submitted in this database are being validated, hand validated. And actually at this point, I'm the validator. We have more than 4,000 spectra right now since the database opened uh, officially last year, last November. Uh, and we have spectra from all over the world. Uh, our focus at headquarters right now is to support our observers uh, who want to actually submit data in our database and help them improve their data acquisition skills and of course focus in uh, data quality as we do with everything else. So a short tour of the database, this is the landing page uh, and if you zoom in this particular menu you can see all types of information and resources for you. Uh, you can see the top 100 objects submitted in the database. Uh, you can search by object name, coordinates, observer, spectral resolution. Of course, you can submit your own spectra. Uh, you can discuss spectra through our forums, ask questions from the community, interact with other observers. You can get information of your own spectra here, such as your tally of observations, the number of total downloads of your spectra, and the average of downloads per observation. So some statistics for you. And here's where you can get help on AV spec, uh, like how to find spectra, how to upload spectra, all our do documentation or guides and manuals, frequently asked questions. So um, the, the spectroscopy database actually can also be reached uh, through WebOps, so, which is uh, our main landing page that has all the submission tools at the AVS, so both photometry and spectra. Um, you know, in the limited time you've had, I gave you a short overview of what we learned from spectra and a short tour of AV spec. But if you want to learn more on how to do spectroscopy or improve your spectroscopy skills, we are offering a four day workshop in November as part of our annual meeting. Uh, we already have an amazing lineup of speakers. You're gonna see Tom there, you're gonna see Lauren there uh, and subjects that are ranging from into introductory to more advanced. So there's something for everyone there. We're also going to be discussing various types of spectrographs, uh, Lisa, Ishel, DIY spectrographs. Uh, we're going to talk about data reduction software uh, and, and uh, demonstration of that software such as Demetra, RSpec, ISIS. And we're going to discuss in depth projects for small telescope spectroscopy. So I want to leave you with just a final thought. Spectroscopy is really fun, really rewarding. And for some people it's scary. Um, but you know something, 
just do it. Get started. There is lots of individuals here who are very willing to, give, to provide help, their resources for you to get started. You're not alone in that. Um, so join the party. It's really, really fun and very rewarding. And with that, I will stop talking and hand it on to our next speaker, which is Percy Jacobs, who's going to actually tell us some of the cool work you can do with a spectrograph. Percy. Percy, I need you to unmute yourself. We got, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. And I need to do that. Good evening, Stella. Is that fun? I can be heard. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much. You will see, um, that's, that's who I am from South Africa. I'm, uh, I belong to I'm a member of the Astronomical Society of Southern Africa, ESA, which we call ESA, and a member of the Pretoria branch of ESA. Um, my introduction to spectroscopy is a journey. It's been a journey through many people that have assisted me through this journey. Um, and I must say, it's been totally enjoyable uh, and not complicated. Yes, you have to learn and you have to start small and you have to grow and you have to learn how to walk first before you become a nice, prof a, a, well, an amateur professional, professional to really do some real science, but you have to grow with it. And I always say to people, there are three things you have to learn with this hobby. You have to learn um, the, the taking of spectra, how to take the spectra. You have to learn how to use the software uh, uh, and, analyze, and analyze the software. Um, taking a spectra, the equipment that is needed. So there's a lot to learn. Uh, but it's enjoyable, and I think that's what it is all about. But my journey has been aided by these people, Tom, John, Oliver, a lot of you people know these names, Robin, Ken, a lot of, I have not met some of these people face to face. I've only spoken to correspondents and across email maybe, or discussed face to face with them. Uh, Richard Walker has been a huge help with some of his published data that he's had, of course, Stella. Uh, Paul Gerlich with a 3D printer, which um, is going to be discussed shortly by Tim, uh, and a couple of local people, Craig helping me, helping me with my 3D printed telescope and my ATM class members, uh, Johan Smith and Chris Stewart have aided me in making things and getting things done. So it's not a journey, a lot of people have assisted me through this journey, I just didn't jump on it by myself. The fun part of spectroscopy is being outside and doing the work, having fun outside, building something and going outside and using it. And I think what Stella has done with AAVSO has given me a purpose with my spectra. Now, not only do I have fun taking the spectra outside using the equipment that I build or use or develop or whatever, Stella has enabled us to take the spectra and submit it into a database for someone else to be, to be useful to someone else that wants to analyze something one day. Um, so we have fun taking the spectra, processing the spectra, and loading it in a database. It's useful for someone else. So this is a very, very nice win-win situation. And I started taking spectra for the AABSA database, I think, beginning of 2019 when it was launched. And it's been fun. And But I've grown one step further now. Now you've got to ask yourself, well, okay, let me, myself, start analyzing the spectra that I take. Um, so I have a group of stars. These, these are the stars that I particularly analyze myself. You can't analyze everything. So I, I try and give myself a set target. This is, these are, this is quite a few. My observing cadence, being a working man, you know, not all of us, we all have a, a, a different day job. Uh, we have a job that has to finance our hobby. Um, and my, so my observing cadence would be based on available times, weather conditions, star visibility at the time, and I try and at least aim once once per month to get to the stars that I'm trying to analyze. Now, so I take a spectrum of a star, I submit it into the database. Then over time, I start putting the data together myself and to see if I can notice something changing in the stars that I'm looking at. And thereby, at the same time, one learns yourself 
how, with these changes that you are seeing, you'll see a change in the star and you can ask the question, why is the star behaving like this? And then you slowly start learning yourself why these things happen to the stars we, we are observing. So it's not about just collecting data and winning the prize, the, the gold cup for submitting 5,000 observations. Yes, well done to you if you did. But it's more about analyzing what you are submitting and do your own homework uh, without asking questions. And it's fun doing that. So that's what I do. And thanks to this, and now I'll go into the next one. So what I, so the equipment that I use, just briefly, I have a low-spec 3D printed spectroscope. Compliments of Paul Gerlick. Well, good evening, Paul. Thank you very much for introducing us and publishing it live. Tim will discuss it later on. Uh, I use a 600 millimeter grating, resolving by a thousand, low resolution spectroscopy, and I can also fit a 1,200 line per millimeter grating. And I use a, a Bosma 18 uh, 2004 Muxitov celestron mount telescope. But, ladies and gentlemen, please do not be distracted by the word low resolution spectroscopy. Be careful what you wish for when you go high resolution. It comes with complications and it may not be what you wanted. There's plenty work and analysis that is required at low resolution spectroscopy. You do not have to jump into the deep end and get high resolution equipment. It's, you can get there later when you become more skilled at the hobby, you can get to that level. Uh, there's plenty to learn and analyze. There's plenty of people that want your low resolution data. Um, so please do not be distracted by, oh, I do low resolution spectroscopy, no one wants it. Yes, there are plenty of people that want that spectrum. So please do not be distracted by that. Um, this is, I started, so what have I learned? So I go outside and say, well, I want to learn something myself. So this is just something briefly I start off by saying, yes, Jupiter. So if I look at the spectrum, I can straight away see uh, what I call the, the methane bands. In, I can see these methane bands uh, in Jupiter and Saturn, and there you can see the shadows in the spectrum. They're the methane bands, they're quite strong. You can see them sitting here in Jupiter and Saturn, and in fact, uh, Uranus as well. So there you can see your methane bands clearly. So not only did I did not have to go out and open a textbook and find out that, you know, I can also go outside, take spectra of the, all the planets, Put all the spectra together and Bob's your uncle you can see yourself these methane bands and in fact there's ammonia bands sitting in um, Jupiter as well so you yourself can analyze these things so clearly there I can see methane bands but I can't see the methane bands and sitting in Mars and and Venus so this so guys this is how simple it is you go outside take a spectra put them together and you can see, you yourself can see changes in the differences between our planets okay Great fun to do. So this is of Mushka, Wolf Rayet Star. We heard early on spoken by our uh, presenters. And we see the broad carbon line. Uh, very interesting. Broad carbon uh, lines going through at the 465 nanometer mark. Um, a very high pressure system. Uh, strong emission lines. Uh, indicates very hot, excited gases. Uh, estimated approximately, I mean, you can measure based on the full width minimum, uh, full width uh, half maximum, you can calculate the velocity, which is of, of, of that gas that is expanding out. You can get a rough estimate. And in this case, it's approximately uh, 2,400 kilometers per second. Rough estimate is maybe not 100% accurate. But these are rough measurements you yourself could do. Um, also, typical, oh, okay, the wolf rights are your helium lines. You can see your two helium lines sitting, the one sitting over there. And of course, the other helium line sitting over there. And of course, the same thing happens for the, on the, the red side of the spectrum. There's your wolf rat, and it's quickly you see your carbon, your two strong carbon bands coming through. And as Stella has indicated, I then proceeded, and I, what, I'm, what I'm starting to do now, I'm now including the magnitude differences, which I get from the, uh, uh, the visual magnitude measurements taken in Naked Eye, uh, visual magnitude measurements taken on the AAV, AAVS uh, website. And I use those graphs and I put those graphs together with my spectra to see what is happening to the star, the star as the magnitude changes on, on the magnitude scale, what is happening to these stars and which I'm starting to do. So in this case, there was no change in the magnitude. It stayed the same for the Wolf Road over this period that I was measuring. But all I'm doing is I'm just putting data together and I'm trying to pick up the changes myself. And the same with, with my one of my interesting stars, Eta Carina. And, and I know Eta Carina has been studied to death. 
but it's still a very, very interesting star. And being in, this, in the Southern Hemisphere, I'm very, very privileged to have it in a nice location of the sky. It's not zenith. I don't have to break my neck or my telescope equipment to get to it. It's in the perfect 30, 30 degree part of the sky. Lovely to view. So, but what I'm looking for in, in, in um, waiting for in Itacarina has been reported in all the clever literature that these emission lines are going to flip. Uh, and they usually flip over a four to five year period. How true is this? I don't know. I've never seen this, but I'm waiting patiently to see this. So I've been monitoring each arena and I'm going to continue monitoring each arena. I don't have, I don't have to have a cadence of once, once per month, but I could probably have a cadence of once per two months um, to measure this, but I'm going to wait for these lines to flip to see if these lines flip eventually. Now, this is what it's all about. Observe and you'll get lucky to see something. Uh, like someone said to me many years ago, if you don't go out and observe, you're not going to get your name attached to something. You're not going to identify changes happening in the sky. You need to go outside and observe something and you continue to observe something until you see something change and you can say, wow, there's something that changed and I, I identified that. That's what it's all about. The same goes through for what I call SS Leap. And as Stella was speaking about the p signet type profile, you can see this p signet prof profile. A, a very nice absorption line and a very nice peak based on rotation. Uh, I won't go into the detail on, on how this all works, but you can see what I'm trying to show you here with the equipment that I have and with the equipment that you have, very simple equipment, you can see these p signet lines. Uh, you can see these absorptions and these rotations happening. Uh, Below, below is what I'm measuring, continue, but now what I find different here, so I've continued in these two months below the, in, uh, what is that, the, um, on the, in, on the 5th and the 8th, 9th August, I've been measured, but there's been no change. There's been a little change over here. There is, there is some hint of a, of a rotational effect taking place there. Um, but I'm waiting for P-Signy at the moment. It's still in my morning sky. Uh, SS Lip is still in my morning sky. It, it rises in my morning sky at about 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm waiting patiently for it to get to about maybe 11 or 12 o'clock at night, which is more comfortable for me to be able to observe it. And I'm hoping to say that of maybe after now, so, okay, this is now in August, so maybe in about probably August, September, October, around right about maybe mid-September towards the end of September, I should get a shot at SS Lip again. And I may see the signal, this P signet profile become more prominent again. Why it's not so prominent in the latest spectra, I don't know yet. I have not asked the questions yet, but I'm kind of I'm going to continue observing to see what is what is happening to the star. Why is the star behaving in the way it is? I go on to the next star, which is a re recurrent nova, as per the AAVSO alert system. It was alerted that there was a nova nova. A V three eight nine A in Sagittarius um, in 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 twenty eight on the twenty eighth of August uh, in two thousand and nineteen, and we rushed out, and we I took a spectra. Just a few uh, the next night I took another spectra. Oh, sorry, this is this. Oh, sorry, the one is on the twenty uh, the August. Then a month, sorry, a, a few days later, a few days later on the th on the third of September. I took another spectra, the magnitude had really dipped from 7.5 to 8.5, you will see over there. And you'll see that the profile has changed. It became a narrower profile. As, it, as the magnitude changes, becomes dimmer, you can see the profile changing. You can see the, how the, how the uh, brightness in the spectrum looked between the two spectra just in a few days. And then just by measuring the full width half maximum measurement again, I'm sort of calculating the expansion rate of, of, of approximately 5,000 kilometers per second. Now, what's mind boggling to me is I'm just Percy Jacobs, a little amateur in having fun, taking spectra, and you are able to do some real science yourself. This, this really tickles me. And this, this is great stuff that we can do this from our backyards. So interesting things you can do with NOVA. The, the thing about it is continue taking spectra of something consistently and you'll see a change eventually. Another star is Escarina, Myras. What is very interesting about the Myra stars are these, t these titanium bands, TI oxide, titanium oxide bands. These bands vary according to the magnitude changes. So for example, on this Escarina, if you look at 
the purple line here, which is the uh, at magnitude, which was magnitude 6.7, and the green line, you will see this purple line, how intense, how big and broad that titanium line, that titanium oxide line. And as the magnitude changes, those titanium bands become smaller or larger as the, as the magnitude gets brighter or uh, dimmer or brighter as it changes. Those titanium oxide bands change over time. You'll also notice in these stars, the hydrogen your Balmer lines change. They come and go as the star goes through its various cycles. This is a 360 day cycle period. You can clearly see in the spectrum, you've got your hydrogen beta line there and then it dims, it fades away, then it comes back again. You can see the same happening with your hydrogen so that's your gamma, hydrogen gamma line. And same happening with your hydrogen beta line over there. You can see it's coming, it's there, it dims away and it comes back again over time. This is over 360 days. And then you base it on magnitude and you can see the magnitude, has, you can then determine. Oh, so you yourself will start learning. Oh, when this star is at magnitude X, this is what's happening to it. Um, so these things change. Very, very interesting over time. Again, Escarine on the red side. You can see the purple line there at, at magnitude at visible magnitude nine you can see it sitting right sorry the blue line sorry magnitude 7.5 i intense that blue line is but as the magnitude changes you can see so does this feature in the spectrum change as well as the, so do the intensity of these two titanium oxide bands they also change um, so very interesting in these mirrors how they change over a period of 360 days and maybe further, they're fluctuating as they move around. And it's all due to the expansion and contraction of gases. And as Ted was explaining, all the different chemistry that's happening within the star, which there is plenty of literature to teach you what's going on in the star, that, to tell you what you're looking at. Same goes for Tisin, uh, very, very nice star, Tisin Tari. Notice the uh, over, this is over 330 days, that is, the, the hydrogen bomber lines disappear, they come back. The hydrogen bomber lines are there, they go away, then they come back again. Very interesting. Um, the titanium bands, the intensity changes again. The titaniums are, are prominent, obviously they're metal rich, uh, they're metal -rich uh, systems. Um, and you'll, these, as these things fluctuate, the magnitudes fluctuate at the same rate. In T Centauri, you, you'll see this uh, in this graph again. You'll see there in the, is the pink line with a visible magnitude, visible magnitude of 6.3. How intense that feature is. But as the magnitude changes down to 7.5, you can see the feature disappears. Very interesting. The feature's there. And as the magnitude changes, just one and a half magnitude points, the feature disappears. Very interesting to note. Today with Delta Sin. Um, a, a, a BE star, and you can see there in your BE star with a hot shell of gas, which has a hot shell of gas around it. Your typical your BE stars, and your helium, your heliums are very prominent in it. But notice your in your in your hot shell, you can see there's your emission line, hydrogen beta emission line, and then it dims, it fades. So it changes in intensity as the star goes through. And this is a measurement over 300 days. So. The more you measure, the more you see these fluctuation changes. And, and then you, of course, read up in literature as to why this is changing, or you listen to people like Stella and they just kindly tell you what's happening, but it's better just to read up yourself and, and learn yourself what's happening. And of course, Delta Centauri, okay, that's just similar. Then let's look at our, our leak, my other famous one. I don't have enough data on this yet. A very interesting star, very, a carbon star. This is only nine months measurement. I have this blue line here, very odd shape in the spectrum compared to the two latest spectrums that look, the, the green and the brown spectrums over here, that look very different to that blue spectrum of, of nine months ago. Why? I don't know yet. I'm waiting to see this change come back again. So right now I'm also waiting for our lift to arise in my morning sky. At the moment, it's about one o'clock in the morning. I'm just waiting for a few nights uh, to get into a more comfortable time. Uh, and then I want to see if this, this feature, this blue feature is gonna change or not. Um, and you'll see that it has these uh, cyanogen bands, these carbon nitrogen bands. They're very prominent in these carbon stars. So what we see, oh, then you can see the, the sodium 
uh, the, the sodium feature. It's, it's 589 nanometers. You've got the cyanogen band seen in the carbon stars. So what we've seen here tonight with all these different stars that Stella and Tom have spoken about earlier on, everyone's different. They're all different. They all have different characters and they're all behaving differently, which is fun to analyze. So my suggestion is you take a few of them in certain of the categories of stars and start taking the spectra, put the spectra together and you, you yourself will see the changes taking place in the stars, which is great fun. And then of course, lastly, sorry, of course, then Alpha, uh, pre, uh, um, Alpha Uranus sitting, everyone's talking about Betelgeuse at the moment, the hottest topic. The main changes in Betelgeuse, and I'm not going to go into the detail in this at the moment, the main changes in Betelgeuse have taken place in on the red side of the spectrum. So anything on the infrared side of the spectrum. So anything from the, I would say from the 630, 640 mark, nanometer mark, right up to the 700, 700,000, to 7,000, uh, up to the 750 nanometer mark, that's where all the changes have taken place in Betelgeuse. You'll see in these spectra, the, there's not much visible change taking place in, in Betelgeuse at my resolution and my capabilities. I can see a little bit of a change taking place. There are little subtle differences I can see, but the major changes come with a higher resolution spectrographs and from the spectrographs that can see more towards the infrared side, right up to the 7,000 or the 7,500 mark. Mine, I can only go up to 680 or 690, and that's where I get cut off, and, but that's where Betelgeuse is really behaving and that's where you really see the changes taking place. And you'll see Betelgeuse on the blue side of the spectrum, there's not much of a change. There's not much happening, except maybe the titanium oxide bands do change in intensity. They are changing in intensity a little bit, but, th but they stay in exactly they are. There's no other feature changes taking place in Betelgeuse except that the titanium oxide bands do change in size and intensity. So continue observing Betelgeuse, we may see something change. Then of course, lastly, just to show you Comet Swan. Uh, this is just, I know this is not a VSO material, but Comet Swan, I was then able to run out at, we weren't able to uh, see Comet Neo as our uh, Northern colleagues were able to see. Um, we certainly didn't, uh, Comet Neo came back to us a few nights ago, about a week ago, we saw Comet Neo low, low on our horizon but nothing the way our northern colleagues saw it. So we, we were very unlucky to see Comet Neo, but we, was, we saw Comet Swan, but I was able to measure the Swan bands. Uh, the diatomic carbon <coughs> as seen with hydrocarbon, burning hydrocarbons, the C2 Swan bands, I was able to pick up the C2 Swan bands in my spectrum of Comet Swan, which was very interesting to see. And this is a, a typical, what a Swan band would look like typically of that and it compares very well with, with what in my spectrum that I wanted, what I took as well. So what I'm trying to show ladies and gentlemen is you can go outside, have fun taking the spectra. You obviously have to learn, you have to go through a learning curve, but you can have fun taking the spectra. You can submit the spectra to someone that really wants your data, plus you can have fun analyzing your own spectra and learning yourself what is taking place in, this, in these stars. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say thank you then and we shall continue observing and continue analyzing and thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Firstly, thank you so much. Let's continue with Lauren Harrington, who is going to give us a, a tutorial how to use a Dobsonian. A spectrum of a Dobsonian. Thank you, oh, Stella. Yes. Okay, I want to start with just one message, one takeaway. If you're going to take away one thing from today, let it be this. Spectrography is easier than you think. And if you can take that away from today, then you're gonna be way ahead of where I was two years ago <laughs> because I thought spectrography must be one of the hardest things that you could do. And also, I thought that you needed expensive gear to do it. Luckily, I found Tom's website and uh, I got sold on the star analyzer. So the expensive gear part went out the window. I took out my star analyzer, my mom's DSLR. I didn't know how to use it. <laughs> um, I just set it out on the balcony under some dark skies, let it roll. And this is a picture I got. And that's a, that's a beautiful image. I mean, don't get me wrong, but if you look at those spectra, well, the bright ones are overexposed here in Orion, but if, even if we look at one that's properly exposed, and you profile it, which is something that I didn't know how to do at the time, but here we'll make the graph anyway. 
there's not really any features in there. This over here is the star. Spectrum's pretty smooth. And that's not what I was hoping for. Um, I may have not known how to make the graphs, but I did know at least that I should be looking for the spectral features and I wasn't seeing any. It was kind of discouraging. And so for a while, I kind of just stopped. I left it, quit spectrography. And then one day my mom came up to me <laughs> and she said, hey, Lauren, I heard about this, this conference they're gonna have, a, a workshop where you learn to do spectrography. And I took a look at it and I said, no, that's, that's way too expensive. It's like 350 bucks for a ticket and travel expenses and everything. I mean, I don't even know if I'm gonna learn anything from it. She said, it's not too expensive. This is for your career. Thanks mom, thanks for saying that because I learned more in those three days than I would have in three years otherwise. And uh, if you were there at SMSW2, then you might remember me from uh, when we were gonna go up the mountain to do our, our test spectra, but then the conditions weren't good. So I was too impatient with every, all the wonderful stuff I've been learning. And I said, I'm just gonna go out by the pool and take some spectra anyway. I had that old DSLR, had the star analyzer, didn't have a way to keep it on the front, but I did have a coffee cup. So <laughs> I just cut that up. And most importantly, I thought by now, I had this here, which is a, a tracker, a star tracker. And I thought, well, this is gonna be better than my telescope because my telescopes can't track. They, they're not gonna be able to get hardly any exposure time at all, right? So I'll just use this tracking DSLR to take my spectra. Went home, I started a project where I was uh, surveying a wolf ray at star, easy Canis Majoris, and that is here. It's not the bright one, um, <laughs> it's the faint one right, right above that. I don't know if you can see it, but it's got a really faint little emission line you can see there, maybe one right there, maybe a faint continuum, right? So I was hopeful when I saw this, I was like, oh yeah, if, if my eye can see it, surely it's gonna look great. And once I make a graph out of it, no, sorry. Hardest lesson you're gonna learn about spectrography is that your eye is always going to see the spectra better than the software is. The human brain is just so good at, at noise reduction. Can't, the computer can't do that. So if I go ahead and make a graph out of it, again, there's not, there's not really much there. You got the star, you got the one emission line, and that's about it, the rest of it's noise. And I was pretty disappointed because this was 20 minutes worth of 30 second exposures. I was like, that's plenty of exposure time. If I can't get this, this seventh magnitude star, and Luckily, around that time, uh, I got a camera for my birthday, an, an astronomy camera. And it's a monochrome CMOS camera, like the kind that they're making nowadays for planetary cameras. And I thought, well, I know, I know you're supposed to be able to do this with video, like, like Tom says. So I'll put my star analyzer on the camera, and I'll put it in my telescope. Now there's see what I can see. Maybe I can get some magnitude zero stars like Vega um, or Arcturus, that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe it'll be enough light to see that. I got a lot more than magnitude zero stars and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. After a long period of optimization, this is now my spectrography setup. I've got an eight inch dog. That's an Orion X-T8. I've got a camera, laptop to control it with, finder scope so I can help you know, find my stuff and um, a chair because it, get, it gets tiring being out there all night long if you don't have somewhere to sit. That's an important part of the kit. And uh, with the camera end of things, let's see a close up. So here's the camera that I'm using now. It's a cool camera, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, any, any astronomy camera should work. Then I've got some spacers because I've also got over here on the end, a prism that brings the spectrum back onto the optical axis, all from the side, back onto the center, and it reduces the off-axis aberrations by doing that. So it sharpens up the spectrum. So to take advantage of that sharpness, I have a lot more extenders than you normally see people using. Um, but you can definitely use that much spacing when you have one of these prisms. And then right on the end here is the diffraction grating itself. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how I capture my spectra using all of that kit. All right, here's what it looks like when I first line up a target at the beginning of the night. There's several things wrong here. It's out of focus and the grating is not 
rotated so that it's perpendicular to the camera. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just pulling out the camera from the focuser of the telescope, making little adjustments to the grating on the end of the nose piece until it runs straight horizontally. That makes things so much better later in software. Okay, next step, rotate the camera with a Dobsonian. See how fast that star is moving? Put my cursor there and I let it drift towards the right so I can see if the spectrum's going towards the right and I want it to go down, then I have to do a 90 degree rotation to the camera, same as I want the spectrum to go. All right, next up comes focusing and that can be tricky uh, with a slitless spectrum like this that's shooting across the screen because your telescope's not tracking. So uh, I do that by messing around with the settings, I zoom in, um, and then there's these telluric lines on the red end of the spectrum from Earth's atmosphere. And those are really good lines to focus on when you're at a fairly high uh, spacing and resolution because those lines will just start to resolve when you hit a good focus, like here. Who knows if you can see that through the compression, but there we go. The water band has just sharpened up into individual lines. And then I lock the focuser. Uh, my focuser has got a lock screw on it. Yes, I took it off the scope for this. <laughs> um, and if you do that, then if you turn the knob or you apply pressure on the focuser, the draw tube won't move. And that will help when you have to rotate the camera again later on. You do that for each different part of the sky you visit. So here I've just star hopped to my target, which is P Cygni. You can tell because it's got that bright hydrogen alpha emission line there. Um, positioning it in the upper left, which is where I like to have my drift start. And then doing the test with the cursor, putting it over a feature and watching which way the feature goes. Went a little bit towards the lower left, so I'm rotating it a bit. There we go. Now it's going straight down. So I'll line it up again in the top and start my capture. Now for settings, normally I like to keep the gain on maximum for most stars. The brightest stars, you don't want to do that. But going down to about mag nine, when you're not using any tracking, you're just going to be stacking hundreds of frames together. That's the whole point of the method. <clears throat> and so if you have the maximum gain, that helps you to swamp the read noise. And the read noise of VWO cameras does go down a bit with max gain. OK, so next up, let's talk about one of the main draws of the drift scanning method, which I just showed you. And that is, you don't need that much equipment. You probably already have a Dobsonian, but, or at least any telescope, it doesn't have to be a Dob. But if you don't, then you can get an eight inch Dob like mine for about $300. Um, the camera is probably gonna be your largest investment because these modern CMOS cameras aren't that cheap yet. Um, and this one that I started out with is the cheapest one that I've used and therefore can recommend, but probably like a webcam would work. And if you try that and it does work, then please send me some examples so I can start putting that in my talks. But um, anyway, the, the, this camera is about $370 new. Um, the prism is optional, but uh, if you want to push your resolution and go up above say R300, you can go up to over R1000 if you, if you use a lot of extenders then the prism is $77 and the star analyzer 100 is 140. So altogether, that's a kit that gets you resolution that is comparable to a low resolution slit spectrograph like, like Percy was showing. Um, and the cost of entry is not that high for that. Okay, so you remember easy Canis Majoris, that Wolf Rayet star that I tried to survey with my DSLR. Well, I came back to that with a 12 inch Dobsonian. And so here's a comparison. Got the DSLR spectrum down here and the Dobsonian spectrum up here. And man, what a difference. I mean, just, just look at the difference that sheer aperture makes. The DSLR had over 20 times as much exposure and it was track exposure too, not, uh, I think it was a third of a second that I did for the 12 inch. But just look, you can see all of these minor emission lines that were completely lost in the noise with the DSLR spectrum. It, also, the monochrome camera helps with an extended range into the UV uh, and the infrared, where the DSLR would cut out even if there was uh, sufficient exposure. All right, I'm going to run through real quick some more examples, just in case you weren't convinced of the method already. 
Uh, here's Vega, which is probably one of the first uh, stars that you're going to take a spectrum of, especially if you start around this time of year when it's so high overhead. It's an A05 reference star. And when I, when I first started, um, I could only see three or four Balmer lines using that, that DSLR. Um, and now I've got it up to the point where you can count alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, and on down. If you zoom in, they just keep on going. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, the tellurics also are, are, once you reach these resolutions, you can start seeing some detail in those molecular bands in Earth's own atmosphere. Um, okay, next one, one of my favorite stars, RT Virginis. Uh, and this one is radiating almost entirely in the infrared. I mean, just look at that. Look at those, those titanium oxide bands uh, that Percy was showing. Here's the tellurics are over here and they look horridly deep <laughs> um, when there's that much light behind them. And uh, in fact, the visible region, you see it gets squashed down so low due to that infrared scaling the screen. I went ahead and I multiplied. So that's what this gray is here is, is multiplied so you can see the vis visual region better. Okay, and uh, last one, this is a spectrum of Arcturus that I took a couple months ago and I'm including it because the resolution measured at around R1000. Um, and I was able to get that all because of the wide sensor size of my current camera, I was able to get that all in the field of view at the same time together with the star. So that's about, that's about the max that you can do unless you had a camera with like a ridiculous size sensor um, would be R1000 if you want to keep the star in view too. Uh, and if you zoom in, uh, then you can actually see some more features that were hidden due to the scaling. The sodium doublet is clearly split. Uh, so is the magnesium triplet. Now you'll see that they are more clearly split up here on the image than they are in the graph. And yeah, like I said, the human eye is better at seeing detail than computers are. Okay, so those have been some examples. Now I'm going to talk about the downside, the main downside to drift scanning, which is that although your limiting magnitude is so much better than a DSLR, because you're going from a one inch aperture up to however big your telescope is, still not as good as if you had the same size telescope tracking. So um, things like supernovae, those are generally out of reach, at least for my scale telescope, which is an eight inch. Um, and I, I shoot from within the city. So I, I generally don't go fainter than Mag 9. But I made an exception the other day for Nova Cassiopeia 2020, because I really wanted to see a Nova. I caught it at where it was almost at the peak, but it was still about magnitude 11 and a quarter. And it came out just too noisy. So that's, that's if you're wondering what happens if you try and shoot one of uh, the fainter targets, you'll probably get a spectrum that looks something like this. Pretty much just noise. You have a bit of a continuum, but. Okay, so to recap, I remember being at SMSW2, the, the spectrography workshop. And I remember sitting there in one of the presentations and just feeling so close and yet so far because now I was learning all that I needed to do, all, all that I needed to know to do what I love. But I also was learning kind of that you could only do it if you had a slit spectrograph and tracking and guiding. And I didn't have any of that and I don't have hope of getting that soon. And so I, I thought, well, maybe someday. But thankfully, there were some people at the workshop who encouraged me to pursue spectra with my star analyzer. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so glad that I tried it out on my daub and I was stubborn with making it work because now I've discovered a way. I mean, there might be other people out there doing it, but I haven't heard. I have personally discovered for myself a way that I can get really great spectra for not much cost. It's a fast setup, uh, even faster teardown. And maybe now I can share this and other people who have been kind of interested in spectra for a while, like I was, but thought it was out of range, well, maybe now those other people can take cool spectra for themselves and get the enjoyment from the hobby. So to forward that goal, I have created a website uh, where I have a guide to drift scanning spectrography. It's detailed, it's simple language, goes step by step. And uh, if you just go to tie-dye 
you can either use that guide yourself if you're interested in learning, or if you know someone else who's interested in learning, then you can share it with them. All right, please, teaching is my thing. If you have any questions that aren't answered by that website and you are just, you want to get into it, but you're not sure about it, just anything, you can write me, lauren at tiedeyeastronomer.com. And remember, you can go to that website to, to find the guide itself. So yeah, thank you for your time. Shall I go, Steph, Stella? Uh, Stella, I think you're muted. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't know. I, I see Stella, but I don't. <laughs> so I'm going to go. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Tim Stone, and, uh, and it's, it's great to follow up with uh, these great um, presentations. I'm happy to, uh, to be a part of the spectroscopy and spectrography community. Um, and I thought I'd share a little bit of my story before I share some of the spectra that I've taken. Um, and, and the reason is because uh, it, it's, it might be a typical story. I've, I've been interested in astronomy since I was a kid. Um, I knew about spectroscopy uh, and spectra and the study of spectra for you know a good deal of my life, uh, but didn't really feel like there was a, a, an opportunity to, to to do much with it. I heard about the star analyzer some years ago and discussed it with um, with uh, uh, a member of the uh, of the physics profession who was uh, in astronomy and and had 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 jobs in astronomy and you know that kind of doctorate kind of stuff and. And uh, they were very discouraging. They 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 said, uh, you know, their uh, their poor resolution, their their uh, dispersion is not great. There's really not much that you can learn from these things. Uh, so you know, it, it probably just isn't something that um, really will get you anywhere. And I I believed them, um, unfortunately. Uh, and and uh, the the disparaging comments. Uh, that were made discouraged me from uh, pursuing spectrography and so I went on to uh, to do deep sky uh, photography. I've been doing that for uh, about 10 years now um, and doing it successfully but uh, something happened uh, uh, along the way in uh, late 2018 in an article on spectroscopy appeared in Sky and Tele Telescope magazine Backyard spectroscopy with our spec, um, and I looked at this and I was I was stunned to find out that that amateur spectroscopy was a thing, and and I I could be doing this. Hey Tim, and I, 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 hello? Tim yeah. just a quick thing. We're seeing your uh, your speaker screen instead of the full slide. Uh oh, that's not good. Hang on, hang on. Sorry about that. No, that was fine. Let me find uh, find Mr. Zoom here. Hello. Stop sharing. Share screen. Share that one. Is that better? Okay. Can you hear me now? You bet. You're good. All right. All right. So, uh, so this. Um, this article showed up in Sky and Telescope. I read it and found out that I had been duped. Uh, so, uh, so I went to the RSpec website. I saw a live chat icon. I pressed it, and this dude named Tom Fields shows up and starts telling me I can do this stuff. And and uh, he was very encouraging. And and uh, I didn't know him. I didn't know he, who he was except from this article that he was the author of this uh, this. The software. Uh, I, I spent some money, and and here we are. Um, I, uh, you know, that was about a, a couple of years ago, uh, and and it has been a journey. Uh, you know, I'm here to tell you, don't listen to the naysayers. They're lying to you, right? This is like very cool stuff, and you can do this. Uh, where did I start? 
I had uh, a, a vintage Mead LXD 55. It's a Schmidt Newtonian F4 telescope. Um, that's what I had. I have, uh, I don't know if you can see it there. I have a little bitty webcam, like seriously, not like a webcam, right? Not even really an astronomical webcam. Um, I had a, a spotter sitting around, which I discovered quickly is important because you can't actually look through the telescope with a spectrometer uh, in front of it. And I took a spectrum, and this is this is one of the first spectrums I took in, in uh, September of 2018. And you can see there, the, like like Tom's uh, Tom's spectrums. There's the hydrogen bomber lines. That was like the first spectrum I ever took. I, I went. I got the stuff in the mail. I screwed the star analyzer onto the front of the camera. I took it out in the driveway, and here I was with a spectrum, and I was hooked. Uh, that was that was like like the the most fulfilling experience I'd had in astronomy for years. I discovered that spectroscopy is a lot of fun, and I, I'm I like having fun. Fun is cool. Astronomy, if that, fun astronomy is cool. This is a lot of fun. I learned more than I've learned in years in astronomy. In the last two years, I've learned chemistry, I've learned quantum mechanics, I've learned, I've learned uh, you know, me mechanical assembly. I've, I've learned all kinds of stuff, right? That just, that just that was a gateway into a whole new realm of learning. And it's all about learning to me. Um, you can get you can get finished images. You can get lots of them in a single night. Where deep sky photography, like if you get one, if you finish one every month, you've been very productive. You know, uh, here's like instant gratification. It was it was like uh, an adrenaline rush. Um, I, I can do it when uh, when and where I can't do deep sky photography. I can do it in town. I can I can do it when the moon is bright. I can do it when it's hazy. I can do it. Uh, the conditions don't have to be perfect, and I'm, I'm doing valid spectroscopy. And I found that unlike my deep sky photos, the data that I uh, that I'm acquiring is actually useful to somebody. Um, <laughs> then somebody something happened that I didn't expect, and that was I realized. I had acquired a resolution addiction, uh, and this is this is the this is a powerful a powerful uh, malady for spectrometer spectrographers. It's similar to aperture focal length dissatisfaction syndrome with telescope owners AFDS. Uh, you know, if I just had one more inch of mirror, I could see something deeper. If I, if I, just, if I just want to get a little more resolution. The low resolution, low resolution left me gasping for more detail. Now, <clears throat> unlike what some people will tell you, star analyzers can get to some very good resolution, as Lauren has demonstrated. Uh, our resolution of greater than one thousand. Um, has been achieved, and I have. A, I'll show you one of my spectrum that I that I um, achieved. That's about thirteen R thirteen hundred. There are reports of resolutions greater than three thousand with star analyzers. So don't let anybody tell you that uh, that uh, the uh, transmission gratings and converging beam uh, spectroscopy doesn't isn't capable of producing nice resolutions, useful resolutions. If you want to go beyond that, though, you're going to have to have a slit. Here's the problem with slits. The instruments tend to be expensive. Um, and, and while they're, while they're fabulous instruments, uh, the commercial offerings in slit spectroscopy, and I wish I had one, um, I'm, I just don't have the kind of shekels that I need to, to get one of those things at this point in time, but I wanted to get higher resolution. And I discovered, um, I discovered the, the low spec, um, spectrometer. Uh, it's a 3D printed spectrometer. Uh, it's invented by Paul Gerlach and I saw Paul on the uh, on the attendee list. I hope he's still here because I want uh, him to hear my voice telling him thank you so much for the, the for the low spec design. It it opened up a world to me that I was going to have a hard time entering in. Uh, you can see my low spec on the back of one of my um, C8s there, um, uh, my C8, is still sitting on that old Mead uh, mount, <laughs> which is starting to show its age and wear, but uh, the low spec um, 
sits on the back of that. I also have a, uh, a an 80 millimeter Acromat uh, that I use. I have an 80 millimeter uh, Apo that I use. Um, this is all uh, this is all equipment that uh, that happens to be here uh, available to me um, through my club or uh, through acquisition over the years. Um, this is a 3D printed spectrometer, so it uses 3D printing uh, technology. If you're not familiar with 3D printing, um, that's beyond the scope of this discussion, but it's very, very cool. And 3D printing itself actually opens up a lot of possibilities to, uh, to astronomers. We're always wishing that we had some custom adapter or some this or that, and we don't have it, and we're making it out of wood or whatever. We, with 3D printing, we can actually make functional parts, as you can see. Uh, my the the low spec is attached to the C8 via this adapter. That's a custom adapter. We printed that out to get the to get the low spec back to the focal plane that we needed to needed it to be at. Uh, so let's just take a look inside the low spec. You can see this is a classical spectrometer setup. For me, one of the values of this was I wanted to learn how spectrometers work, and there's no way to learn something like that. Than to build one, and this this is this is a build. You're going to build this if you want to do this. You're going to print the parts out and then put them together, like you used to print uh, put model kits together when you were a kid, model airplanes or whatever. This is an assembly. Uh, here's the slit wheel. The light is focused on the slit. Comes through the uh, slit aperture, hits this mirror, goes through the collimation lens, hits the grating, comes back out um, to, through the camera lens, and the camera will be attached over here. Um, and when you see uh, when you see it in action, the whole thing just makes sense. Here's the here's the the uh, slit wheel um, up in the upper right. Here uh, we can see the uh, we can see the pick off mirror here. So this is a this is a mirror. The light that doesn't go through the slit bounces off here. Hits this pick off mirror. Comes back out. Uh, comes back out through this aperture, so you put a guiding camera out there so you can guide for longer exposures, which is very important with a slit spectrometer. This is the back side. Uh, you can see the micrometer for adjusting the angle of the uh, grating. This is the focusing assembly for, for focusing the spectrum on the camera. Um, this, is, uh, this has been a great learning experience, but, but it's all about the spectrums. So let's show some spectrums. With the low spec, um, I have acquired a solar spectrum, for example. Now, you got to be careful when you're pointing your telescope at the sun, of course. And the, the first low spec that I ordered, that I built, I kind of melted it one time when I got too close to the sun. <laughs> so I had to build another one. Uh, fortunately, there was, uh, there was a new design, a rev of the design, so I had a, an excuse for building the other one other than I melted the first one. Um, but but when this is with a 1200 line per millimeter um, grading, just like Percy uses with this with the solar uh, with the solar spectrum, and what you get with this resolution, which is somewhere around 9,000, 10,000 resolution, I, you get what I call the uh, the zoom wow factor. So uh, as you zoom in on the spectrum, you it seems like you just like never run out of detail. Uh, in the spectrum, and it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going until you see just the magnificent complexity of the uh, of the solar spectrum. There's so many lines, and this isn't even really a terribly high resolution uh, for uh, for solar spectrum. Here, you, here we have the uh, the H and the K calcium two lines that that Stella referred to as being very important. They're very important in many stellar studies and also in cosmological studies because they're so prominent in stars that they show up in galactic uh, spectrums as well. Um, as we go across, we see I've got the Fraunhofer lines marked with uh, uh, with um, Tom's, this is our spec by the way, with Tom's reference for Fraunhofer lines. We come over and we see the, the big G line um, we see uh, over here a little bit, we work our way through the blue and over into the cyan. There's a uh, hydrogen uh, beta line. And, uh, and at this resolution, as, as Percy has shown, you can see, uh, you can draw conclusions from the shape of these lines. Um, 
Here's the, the magnesium triplet, which is, which is a magnificent landmark um, in, uh, in the solar and, and many other spectrums. Um, and as you can see, there's thousands of lines here. And of course, you, you, you wanna identify them all and it would take the rest of your life to identify them all, but they have all been identified. So if you really wanna know what line this is at 5455.92 or so, uh, you can go out to, the, to a catalog and you can find out what that line is. Um, get over here into the sodium doublet, um, which you know, kind of for me is a resolution landmark. If you can resolve the doublets, you, you, that's kind of an accomplishment. Um, this is sodium two or sodium one. Uh, I'll get over here. I'm, I'm working my way across. I hope you can see all of this. Here's the hydrogen alpha line. That's very, very dark in the solar spectrum, very, very deep. Um, and of course it has the wings and these wings can tell us things about, about hydrogen, about the, the conditions of the sun uh, or whatever star that we're looking at. We get over into the uh, tellurics. Here is the, the oxygen two B band. It's beautiful. One of the most beautiful pieces of, this, of the solar spectrum you're ever gonna see is these beautiful doublet pairs of, uh, of the B band. Um, zoom in on that a little bit more, do a little bit of more zoom wow here. Those are, those are just lovely. They're great for calibration. These, these, these are always visible um, in a spectrum because the spectral light has to go through our atmosphere to get there. Here we have uh, the, the first uh, set of H2O lines. They're not nearly as well organized because H2O is a much more com complicated molecule than, uh, than O2 is. Here we get over to the O2A band, which again has more of these beautiful pairs of doublets. And then we get over into the near infrared. Um, and this I wanted to get to because this is, uh, this is important for, uh, uh, for stellar uh, work as well. You get over here into the near infrared and you start seeing um, more water, but you get further over, further over, and you see these, these, uh, this triplet here. This is a calcium two triplet. So this is the same atom uh, that's producing the H and K lines. And you get over here in the infrared, you can see more lines from that atom, and uh, and those uh, complement the the work that you can see, the the conclusions that you can draw from the calcium two conditions in that star. We keep going, and I don't need to go all the way over. We can we can get the we can undo the zoom wow, go all the way over to about ten thousand with my web camera, um, ten thousand angstroms before I have no no sensitivity left. There's there's plenty of data out there. My camera can't get it, all the way out to ten thousand. That's not too bad. But what can you do <clears throat> if you have a solar spectrum? Well. Here's, um, here's a Jupiter spectrum that I, that I acquired at some point. It'll show up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. This is a spectrum of Jupiter. There's the, uh, this is a lower resolution spectrum. This is taken with my uh, ED80 Acromat, also at the, with 1200 lines per millimeter. Um, and the 10 micron slit, but uh, it's not quite the, the high resolution of the solar spectrum because you don't have nearly as many lines, uh, nearly as many photons to work with. And, and you, can see, uh, you can see that this is basically a solar spectrum. Jupiter shines by solar, uh, re reflecting solar light, but as Percy has pointed out, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. As Percy has pointed out, um, you, uh, uh, you can see that there's uh, methane bands. There's a, there's a methane band that's clearly not part of the solar spectrum. And if you load up, um, if you load up the, a solar reference spectrum, you can see here's the solar reference spectrum. Here's the Jupiter spectrum. They're shaped a little bit differently with, with the slope because it was made with different instruments, which have different uh, transmission characteristics. But, it, but if you take and divide one by the other, you now get, you get the difference. So here is the, is the difference between the two. And you can very, very clearly see this is a big difference. This is a methane band. 
Uh, it's, it's at the 6200 angstrom mark, which is a well-known uh, methane, uh, well-documented methane um, absorption. Uh, over here is another one at 5425 or so. And then we get this nice little faint one there that we, you would probably miss if you hadn't, uh, if you hadn't done the division at uh, about 5750. These are all methane signature uh, changes. Now, if this was a variable, if this was two variable star, um, if this is a variable star time sequence and we did, did that division, we would see clearly what was different at time one and time two, what had actually changed and how much it had actually changed because this is essentially a ratio of the two spectra. So this is a, this is a, a demonstration for myself of, of exactly how you do time studies of, uh, of, uh, of various, uh, um, various things. Now uh, for Stella, um, I, I stayed up all night last night um, waiting for Betelgeuse to rise and, uh, and I, I got a, a spectrum of, of, uh, of Betelgeuse um, and Percy has shown us a, a spectrum of Betelgeuse. Of course, it's back in the news now because it's not quite as bright or as dimming or, or whatever. There's all kinds of speculation now, again, that it's going to blow up this year or something, you know, which would, which would be a perfect uh, ending for 2020, right? Uh, <laughs> I think yeah, I think if 2020 ends with Betelgeuse supernovae. How perfect, right? Uh, so this was with the star analyzer. This isn't with the split slit spectrometer. This is about R1300. Um, and and again, this is this is a very valid um, spectrum. There's a lot of work that you could do with. There's a lot of conclusions you could draw with this spectrum. This was this was not with the slit spectrometer. I want to leave you. With, with, the, with the clear understanding that you don't have to go out and spend a ton of money to do good work here. Um, this, this is, this is uh, with this SA200 um, on, an e, on an 80 millimeter refractor. Um, with, it's an APO, so it, so it doesn't have the chromatic aberration at the blue end that, that you would with an acromat. Um, this has got about 105 or 110 millimeter spacing between the between the um, star analyzer and the sensor. Uh, it has the 3.8 degree prism, which helps with the with the, the coma correction. Um, and and j just from an aesthetic perspective, I want to show you what this spectrum actually looks like on the computer screen when you're taking this picture. I, I am blown away when I see stuff like this on my computer screen in the middle of the night. It's, the beauty of it is amazing to me. And, and the detail, the information that's in there, it, it blows my mind. And, and I can't tell you before spectrography, when the last time that my mind was blown by something that I did in astronomy, literally. Right, I can't tell you because it because it's been so far back that my old my old brain doesn't remember it anymore. Right, this is the kind of stuff. If you want to have some fun and you want to have your mind blown, this is the place for you to be. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it because that's a lie. You can do it, and I'll help you. The people on this panel will help you. There are plenty of other people who will help you. Call us up. Text us, email us, do something, but get into this. It's so awesome. All right, Stella, back to you. Wow. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I had, that was that was awesome. Thank you so much for uh, a, 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 a mind blowing um, trip. To stellar spectroscopy, I love that thing. All those, uh, all the spectra and everything you can do with modest means, with small telescopes. And there's more to go. And just remember, these are scientific spectra. This is spectra where you can actually assess something for um, for stellar properties, for science. Not only just have fun. Uh, I would like to remind everyone who is uh, attending that the recording of this and of all our webinars will appear on the AAVSO's YouTube channel. Please subscribe and also follow us on social media for updates on what is happening in the wonderful world of variable star astronomy. 
Um, also, we're going to send you a survey. Please give us feedback and remember to renew your AVSO membership. I keep saying that, renew your AVSO membership. We are counting on, on our members in order to continue programs like this. Um, I would like to also remind you of our webinar in November. Uh, it's going to be an online spectroscopy workshop. Um, sadly, we cannot meet in person quite yet, but this at least will open uh, the world of spectroscopy to people all over the world. Uh, you can find it here on our webpage, everywhere. Uh, so there's still thoughts, so please sign up. Uh, I would like to thank again Voice Astro and Ati Cameras that have been supporting this webinar. Sadly, we don't have time for Q&A. We have consumed all our, hours, all our time with wonderful, wonderful, exciting science. But at this point, I would like to um, thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, Tom Fields, Percy Jacker, Lauren Harrington, and Tim Stone, my colleagues who have been uh, actually sharing their excitement and their hard work with spectroscopy with the rest of you. I wish you all to stay safe. And we'll be here again next Saturday talking about young stellar objects. And just the last, a last thing about spectroscopy, just do it. Just try it. You have absolutely nothing to lose and a whole world of wonders to discover. Have a wonderful rest of your day, night, evening, whatever it is. And again, stay safe. Thank you all for attending. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>